All right, here we go. Shake, rattle, and hum. Cups up. Toast to the morning word crowd. God bless you and God bless America. God bless India and all the other places that are watching us. I haven't seen Minaj yet this morning, but I'm sure he'll be up there. And uh, we want to thank you for being here. Whether you watch this live right now or catch us uh, recorded later, I do want the, what I was talking to um, Al about just a second ago is some people are interested in watching us off of Facebook. They have their own reasons, and I support all of them. Uh, we do have a YouTube channel that you can watch us on. New Beginning Family Worship Center has a YouTube channel, so you can check us out there. But I want to say uh, uh, congrats, not congratulations, but thank you, and, and uh, thank you for your service to all of our school teachers and to all of our first responders and to our military personnel. Uh, thank you for the job that you do. I try to remind, uh, remember you guys every day. Uh, so that we don't take you for granted. Uh, now, if you have your Bible, we're going to 1 Kings chapter 11. If you've noticed, as Brandy has, the title is The Little Foxes Spoil the Vine. You know who wrote that? Solomon. In the Song of Solomon, the little foxes spoil the vine. What does that mean? Well, it's the little things that make a big difference. And in this case, a big bad difference. Uh, let's look at 1 Kings chapter 11. <clears throat> Verse nine, are you ready? Here we go. So the Lord became angry with Solomon because, very important word, you need to circle that, because his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this and have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father, David. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant, David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Now, we remember that Solomon, <clears throat> David's son, the successor to the kingdom, and during his whole time uh, of uh, kingship, uh, Israel had relative peace, uh, the borders expanded, and God prospered um, the nation of Israel in an almost a supernaturally way because of the wisdom of Solomon. So the question is, is if Solomon is so wise, and he was, the scripture says, the wisest man that ever lived, why wasn't he wise enough to, to continue following the Lord and obeying his word? Well, it's one thing to have wisdom. It's another thing to apply it. You must, we must obey the wisdom that God has given to us. And I want to point out this morning just a, a, the place where this whole thing started to run off the rails. <clears throat> All right. If you back up to chapter 11, verse 1, it says, but King Solomon loved many foreign women, all right, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, the women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, Sidonians, and the Hittites from the nations whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these, the women, in love, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. And then he goes on and says that Solomon went and built them places to worship. Now, I could get funny with this, you know, but uh, Solomon had 700 wives, <clears throat> princesses, and 300 concubines. I don't even want to start to talk about the trouble that man had under his house, but here's, here's the deal. Uh, in those days, Solomon didn't have to live with them like husbands do today. I know we would look at some of us men would go, who in God's name would live in the house with 700 wives? I wouldn't live in the house with two wives. I'm about to go crazy with one. But the point is, is that Solomon didn't have to live with any of them. In this setup, Solomon could go and sit on the throne, do his king stuff, and those women would only be come into his presence when they were sent for. Even his, his uh, uh, wives of his people, the, 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 the Jewish wives couldn't just come and go. They all had to be sent for by the king. 
So he's got concubines. That's just women that he just sleeps with. He probably don't even know their names. And then he's got 700 wives. I don't know how he could remember the names of 700. That The last thing you want to do is have one wife in there and call her the other, girl, the other girl's name. You know, have wife number seven and call her by the wife number 699. That ain't going to fly well, but they, he didn't care. But the point is, is that his, his wives turned his heart away. And now God knew that, all right? <clears throat> and God, God knew that that would happen. And he had warned not just Solomon, but David and all of the, the, from the beginning of the kings, he had told them not to intermarry. And that's why it's so important today, if we look at this, in making sure that our close friends and our spouses, um, our most intimate relationships, our close friend and our spouses are believers. Why? Because unbelievers will lead you astray. Am I saying that we shouldn't be friends, uh, friendly with and uh, you know work with and uh, unbelieving people? Certainly not. That's not what the scriptures teach us. But but when you're talking about forming an inner circle, and then when you're talking about forming a home and a family, you need to find you someone that is of the same faith, all right? If you're a Christian, you need to find a Christian woman, all right? Uh, if you're a Christian woman, you need to find a Christian man. Now, that doesn't mean that both of you are perfect and that you're gonna do it perfect, but at least you have the same foundation to build on. That's what you need, to, that's what's important, the same foundation, the same morals, the same truth that everyone's, you know, um, governing from or operating from, you know, not the Quran over here and the Bible over there and the Book of Mormon over there, uh, but the, the scriptures. Now, um, this is, this I want to show you now was not the, the problem alone. Um, I, 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 was, I was reading this this morning, I backed it on up and I found another little problem. All right, you ready? Look at 1 Kings chapter 3. All right, 1 Kings chapter 3. So the, Solomon's problems, all right, Solomon's problems did not begin with the women. You know, it says that the women turned his heart. But Solomon's problems began a little bit earlier than that <clears throat> in chapter 3. So flip over with me to 1 Kings chapter 3, and here's what we're going to find out. Now Solomon made a treaty with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. That was not uncommon for nations to make alliances to help bolster one another in the same region, support one another, so forth and so on. So he made a treaty with the king of Egypt and married Pharaoh's daughter. Now that was the beginning of it right there. But it, it got, there's, a, there's another little thing down here you need to see. Another little fox we need to look at. Remember, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. So here's another little fox. Now Solomon made a treaty with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married Pharaoh's daughter. Then he brought her to the city of David until he had finished building his own house, the house of the Lord, and the wall around Jerusalem. Meanwhile, the people sacrificed at the high places because there was no house built for the name of the Lord until those days. And Solomon, watch this now, and Solomon loved the Lord walking in the statutes of his father, David. Now circle this word if you got the new King James. Here it is, except, except that he sacrificed and burned incense at the high places. Now, he sacrificed and burned incense at the high places. That means that what they were doing, Solomon and subsequently all of the nation of Israel, they were worshiping at the old sites of the pagan worshipers. The pagan worshipers had built uh, places of sacrifice all in the, the hills and on in the valleys and so forth, and they had places of worship. Well, Solomon and them said, well, you know what, we'll, here's what we'll do. Uh, we'll just go to their places and worship since, we had, since Solomon hadn't finished the temple yet. It sounded good. And they said, you know, hey, as long as we're worshiping the Lord, it really doesn't matter where we worship. Now, has anyone ever heard that? All right, doesn't matter where we worship. It doesn't matter really how we worship, so to speak, as long as we're worshiping the Lord. Well, it makes a lot of difference, and it's especially in the Old Testament, because in Deuteronomy chapter 12, information that Solomon had, all right? This was from the time of Moses. This is information that Solomon had, and this is what Solomon disregarded. This is the little fox that started him down the path of compromise. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, you don't have to go there. Let me read it. It says, these are the statutes and judgments which you shall be careful to observe 
in the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you to possess. In other words, into the promised land, Canaan, which is where Solomon and, and Israel are now. All right. All the days that you live on the earth, verse two, you shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall dispossess serve their gods on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree, and you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the carved images of their gods and destroy their names from that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God with such things, but you shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses of all your tribes to put his name there for a dwelling place, and there you shall go. Well, Solomon knew that he was not supposed to be worshiping God at all of these other uh, pagan uh, altars and worship places, uh, th but it was a place of convenience, and, and they didn't have a place. All right, so there was a little fox right there. Uh, doesn't seem big. They're worshiping God. They're burning incense to God. They're making their sacrifices to God, but it wasn't where God said to do it. Another little fox, I, I'm not gonna go there, but another little fox that you can find, I think it's in First King, uh, First King uh, verse, uh, chapter seven. Uh, let me flip over here really quickly. Yeah, <clears throat> in First Kings chapter seven, uh, actually, chapter six, the last verse, it says that uh, it took seven years for Solomon to build uh, the temple of the Lord. But it goes down and says that it took 13 years for him to build his own home. Now, another little fox was that God was going to prosper the nation. That was his intent, prosper the nation through Solomon's wisdom and through the wisdom of the scriptures. It was never his intent that he would prosper Solomon to the extent that Solomon would begin to, to um, have his heart turned uh, by his uh, money. Now you say, well, Pastor Randy doesn't really show here that his money turned him away, but here's what happened. Uh, Solomon acquired great wealth and in Deuteronomy chapter 17, uh, let me see if I can go over here really quickly. Deuteronomy chapter 17. Uh, I'll try to be quick. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 17, 16 through 20. Look at my notes. All right. And it says, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 17, <clears throat> God speaking. He says, when you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you and you possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. And that's what they did with Saul. That's where it started. You shall certain, surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother, but he shall not multiply horses for himself nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses for the Lord has said to you, you shall not turn that way again. So if you go and you'll look, it says specifically that Solomon was getting horses uh, from Arabia, from Egypt, that he was building great wealth. And what that led to was great taxes on the people and a burden to the people. You can see the warning of it in 1 Samuel chapter eight. So my point is, is that Solomon's personal prosperity caused great popularity. His wisdom and his prosperity called, caused great popularity. Well, the fact that he was a king made him desirable by all the women. They, you know, women love to run with men with power and, and uniform and all that. And then you, you multiply that with money and, and, uh, and you can see from all of the women, the 700 wives, the princesses, 300 concubines. I mean, a man can't, man can't stand, on, stand up under that kind of pressure. So it was all of these little things coming to bear, all of these little foxes worshiping in the wrong place after God said not do it, uh, taking the wealth and the prosperity of the, of the nation and using it for yourself. Doesn't seem like a bad thing since he was prospering the nation to make a little bit, but here's what the scriptures tells us uh, all through the scriptures that, that uh, riches are deceitful. They serve to steal our allegiance and they become our 
the, they become uh, our strength. They become our confidence. They, uh, you say, okay, well, if the price of gas goes up and the price of food goes up and all that, I've got enough money, I can make it. Instead of saying, you know, God's going to take care of me. So we have another little guy here. It's just a little, it's just a little fox. You know, a wallet full of money becomes a little fox that'll steal our heart. Worshiping at the wrong place is a little fox that will steal our heart. And then looking at a little fox becomes a little fox that'll steal our heart. There's a lot of little foxes around here. Now, when you get up to 60, things change, all right? Uh, but Solomon was in uh, the zenith of his youth, his prosperity, and his power, and there was little foxes everywhere that were trying to steal his attention. And when they stole his attention, they stole his heart. And it goes on to say that Solomon followed the Lord, but with not with all of his heart. That's what it said. He did not fully follow the Lord. And it set him up. It set him up for failure because it was the little things, the little bitty things. See, guys, it's true for me. It's true for Solomon. It's true for us. Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. And here's something that we need to learn. Randy Fuller needs to learn. Everyone needs to learn is if the wisest man in the world could fall prey to compromise the deceitfulness of riches, the lure of the little foxes, and, and to the place where God had to bring pretty severe correction, then it can happen to us too, all right? It can happen to us too. So what we need to do, what you and I need to glean from this lesson is, is that we do not need to tolerate Neither do we need to rationalize the little sins and the little things that God said not to do as being nothing, as being meaningless, because they add up. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. And, um, and so we all need to be wary of it in ourselves and with other people. And so uh, we just need to have great accountability uh, of ourselves to the word and of ourselves to one another. That's why it's important that you be around other believers. You know, it's not that other believers can prevent you from going stupid and going off into the land of, oh no, but it's, it makes it a little bit more difficult, right? Uh, when you got other people, quote unquote, watching you and living around you, uh, kind of helps steer you clear of stupid sometimes and steer me clear of stupid. So, Let's remember that. Let's remember this. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's the little things. Now we again, we're not perfect. We just read yesterday that that God can forgive all sin. We'll forgive all sin if we can truly repent of it. But we can't become presumptuous and we can't become rationalizing and tolerant of even the littlest things because they can add up. So we have to deal with them ruthlessly. Jesus said this: If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Did he mean for you to pull your eye out? No. What he was saying was deal ruthlessly with those things that cause you to sin. Don't be tolerant. Don't rationalize it. Um, you know, and so there's, I, I, I'm not going to even give some examples of that because we, we all are, are at different places and dealing with different things. But we need to be wary. We need to be wary of these things. If Solomon can fall, we all can fall. And uh, the little foxes, all right? Let me just close with this. Uh, the little foxes, uh, the little bitty sins. But, but uh, David had a trouble with women. Solomon had trouble with women. And I'm just going to say it. All men have trouble with women. Little fox is going to give us trouble. Now, I, don't, I can't say the same about women. I just know a couple of women. I'm not saying that women have the same problem with men. But I'm just saying that when you continually put men and women together in situations that it is not overseen, does not have accountability, so forth and so on, it, it, I'm telling you, um, we all know this from our high school days and our college days. Just not going to be a good recipe. Can't stand that pressure long. And especially if you put alcohol with it. I'm not going to get into all that. But, my, but we need to be wary. We can all fall. 
It happens to the best of us. It happens to Solomon here. It happened to King David, a man that God said was a man after his own heart. So we all need to be uh, attentive to the little foxes that can spoil the vine, okay? So having said all that, um, the weather looks like it's breaking here in Alabama. It's going to be a little bit cooler, nice. The we, the uh, the um, holiday uh, weekend is coming up. I hope everyone has a, a safe day. We'll see you tonight. We're going to be preaching and teaching out of the eighth chapter of uh, The Bondage Breaker by Neil Anderson, talking about seducing spirits, mediums, um, palm readers, and all that kind of stuff. You can catch this later recorded on the uh, internet. We love you guys. Thank you for your support. God bless you. God bless America. And we'll see you tomorrow. Good Lord willing and the saints don't rise. Peace out.